Hello, Family Church. It's wonderful to be with you again. And this is our third message in the series called The Hall of Faith, which is from Hebrews chapter 11. And we invite you to turn there in your Bible. And this week I was thinking about a story. And the story is set in a beautiful little town in Washington called Dante's Peak. And the story is that this is a beautiful place where people love to come on vacation. In fact, it's like voted the second place most people are the most delightful place to live. And so in the middle of that setting, the volcanologist who's been watching his seismic machines realizes that all kinds of disturbing signals are coming up. And so he confers with another volcanologist that lives in the local area. And they become convinced that not only is there something troubling coming, but in fact that the little town of Dante's Peak, that the volcano that's been dormant for many, many years is going to blow. And it's going to blow in a, in a, a way that's going to be like a million atomic bombs. This, this story is found in the movie Dante's Peak. It came out in the late 90s with Pierce Brosnan and Linda Hamilton. And unlike most natural disaster movies, where it mostly focuses on the pyrotechnics of the disaster, a lot of this movie is the, the two of them becoming convinced that in fact the mountain is going to blow. And they go around and they are trying to convince their authorities over them, the city authorities. They're trying to get the people to, to completely evacuate the city. They're, they're trying to spur drastic action with a warning. And very few people want to listen to them. In fact, as, a, as I thought about the movie, what I, what I was feeling when I was watching it is, you know, a warning is really irritating. If somebody comes and tries to tell you that some terrible things are going to happen, and so you need to change your lifestyle dramatically, it's extremely irritating. Unless, of course, it happens to be true. And then it may save your life. And of course, this is a relevant idea in the whole COVID crisis that we're in the middle of and all the different ways in which warnings come and sometimes unclear about what the warnings are and, and how severe things are going to be. And, and in that process, I think you can feel how irritating warnings can be but if they're the truth, they'll save your life. And, and let me just underscore where we're going here. God's warnings are always the truth. And even though they may call for drastic action that changes our lifestyle, they are always sure, even if we don't know when they're going to happen. So we are in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews is a book that's written to Jewish people who have been introduced to Jesus. And they are wavering, some of them, in the decision to follow Jesus or to follow Moses and the law. And it really comes down to a lifestyle of, do I work so that I can be pleasing to God and earn my salvation? And in the Jewish setting, it was the rituals and the sacrifices and the temple and the priests. Or do I trust in Jesus? And so he's been talking for 10 chapters about how Jesus is superior to Moses and about how faith is superior to the law. And then in chapter 11, we, we go through a whole bunch of Old Testament heroes. And heroes inspire us. And he chooses those for the Jewish people to say, look at the people that you have been admiring all your life and see that they, in fact, were pleasing to God because of their faith, not just because of their actions. And so we are looking this week at the character of Noah. And Noah is obviously a very well-known story of God's warning to Noah and telling him to build an ark. And so let's read in chapter 11 of Hebrews, the one verse that we're going to be covering from Hebrews 11 today. So Hebrews 11, he starts in, in verse 7 and he says, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built the ark to save his family. And by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. So we want to look at not only what does faith do, but what is faith? If we want to look at the why that people do things, it's more important than the what that they do. And so it emphasizes here that Noah's faith made him listen that God had given him a warning, 
And it was outside of his experience and really hard to believe. Impossible to believe and impossible to do. So let's look back in the the book of Genesis and see what that was. Because God's warning then in Genesis chapter 6 was, I am going to destroy the world. Now, what's interesting as we read through this passage is it also shows you uh, a compassion and an empathetic God when he is still bringing judgment and destruction. Let's look at the verses. It says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. I don't know of a description in all of Scripture where deeper sin, where sin has become so entrenched. It says that the inclination of their hearts were only evil all the time. And you know, there are times in our world and times in history when things have been awful and violence and wickedness and sexual immorality have been rampant. Here he says they had gotten to such a degree that there was nothing else. And then it goes on and it says, the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. His heart was deeply troubled. And I love these pictures that you get of God, even in the midst of this big moment of judgment, where it says he's deeply troubled, that we, we serve a God whose heart is moved for us, that he cares deeply for us. And even, even when he has to discipline, even when judgment comes, he doesn't do it with delight and desire to destroy. And some people get a wrong picture of God. And, and I think this is a great place where he came to the conclusion that human beings had become so evil that the only, the only remedy was to wipe them out. And then he says, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals and the birds and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. We talked last week or two weeks ago about the spiritual armor, and we talked about the fact that faith, the shield of faith, is designed to extinguish the flaming arrows of the enemy. And I want you to try to think about what it must have been like to be Noah. He he was living in a time and a place where not only were people doing what was evil, but they were calling evil good. I mean, they thought it was normal. They thought that that's how they should be. And in the midst of that, Noah wanted to live in a way that was connected to God and was pleasing to God. And can you imagine how alone he must have felt? That, I mean, sometimes it feels like The whole world is going the wrong direction and there are only a few of us that are wanting to follow God and stick close to the scriptures and and be obedient. And yet there are many, many around us that are also of the same heart. Can you imagine what it must have felt like? And and I was thinking, what would be the arrow? Because we talk about flaming arrows. It's it's not the hole that they leave, but the fire that they start. And it's those, those attacks often in our thinking where we begin to to feel, in, I think in Noah's case, feel alone. And, and I would say maybe the arrow would be a, one of despair, that there's nobody else following God. There's nobody that cares what's right. And, and I alone remain. And in fact, that was the truth. And yet, Noah believed God. Noah believed God, in fact, in spite of the fact that nobody else was believing God. He believed God, in fact, in spite of the fact that God told him some things that were going to be really hard to believe. And he believed him for a long time. And I want you to see that the, the faith is what Noah is known for. Yeah, we know he built an ark and we know that the animals came and the world was destroyed. And sometimes we focus on the, the kid story part of it. And Hebrews is focusing here on, you imagine what faith it took to believe God when nobody else around you believes God? To extinguish that hopelessness and that despair and that it's never going to happen and I can't know the future. and Just trust God and to continue to do what God calls him to do. And I think it's a great foil for us because the warning then was, God says, I'm going to destroy the world. God's warning now is there is a future time coming when again in judgment, God will destroy the world. And it won't be by rain, by rain and by water, by flood. And God gave the rainbow as the sign for that. And that was the original meaning of the rainbow is this is a promise. I'll never destroy again the earth by flood. But God says in Second Peter that there'll come a time when the world is destroyed and it'll be destroyed by fire. 
And so even in Jesus' day, when he was looking ahead to the end, he said in Matthew 24, but about that day or that hour, the day of the Lord, the day of the end, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And then he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, before the flood people were eating and drinking and marrying and, eat, and giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. And Jesus said, that picture in history of what happened around Noah's time is, a, is also a picture of what's going to happen in the future. That there will come a time when wickedness and evil will become so intense that God will send destruction. And he says, and people are not going to believe the warning and they're not going to live like it. They're going to be eating and drinking and partying and just living their lives without a knowledge of God, without a fear of the Lord, without caring about what God thinks. And so that picture is important to you and I as we have just gone through a process where we realize that, that the great and mighty civilization that we live in can be absolutely humbled by a tiny virus you can't see except with an electron microscope. And I think maybe it shows us how fragile life can be and what we take as our entitlement and our rights, that God has the right to change. And he, in fact, says he's going to do that. And the Bible is full of prophecy, and it tells us some things about the end times. And, and, I, and I think it's an important part of our understanding of Scripture. But let me give you a couple of cautions. Um, I see people that look ahead, and maybe they even see things like the virus that's going on now, and they say, is this the end times? Is this, is this when the world is going to end? And, and sometimes they do it, and they just live in fear, and they want to, you know, curl up in a corner and live in a bunker and, and just let the fear take over. And some people, you know, they, they are doing it, and they, they only think about escape. I can't wait to get out of here. I can't wait till heaven comes. And, and believe me, if we, if we understood heaven better, we wouldn't hang on so long here at the end of life. But other people just take it, and they make it like, almost like a hobby. Like, we're studying prophecy to find out is it the Russians or the Arabs? And who's the Antichrist going to be? And, and there's nothing wrong with those questions except that it's not a hobby. It's not supposed to make it so it's just like a fun thing to study. It's supposed to cause us to live in boldness, to live in action, to live in a desire to make sure that, that the people we know know about Jesus, if at all possible, if there's anything we can do. And I think of Noah, who in this time could have hidden in fear he could have not believed. In fact, even when God clearly says something to me, it's easy to live in faith for a short time and, and then to become doubting and thinking maybe that didn't really happen or maybe it's not really going to happen. And so in the statement of the warning, God told him not only what's going to happen, he told him what he wanted to do. He said, I want you to build an ark. And so Noah's faith led him not only to believe God, to trust God, in spite of the fact that nobody else did, but he also took action. In fact, what God was calling to him, him to do was rather impossible. He said, I want you to build an ark. I want you to build a boat. And the, this is a, a literal boat that has been built by this uh, Dutch Christian just to help people see how big it was. And it was a part of his faith journey and he wanted it to be a, an encouragement to the faith of others. But this boat is 450 feet long 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. Can you imagine a four and a half story building that's longer than, uh, than football fields? 450 feet. And he built this with his sons and just their family. And it took at least 75 years up to maybe 120 years. And, and you imagine what his neighbors thought? I mean... If you're going building a, a boat in your backyard that's that big, they're going to think you're crazy. And not only do they think he was crazy, but they think he was crazy for a long time. And so I think it's a powerful picture for you and I that there is a long ways often between the time when God speaks and the time when we finally see God making the action that he's promised. And we live our lives in the land between, the land between what was and the land between what will be. 
The land between when God says, this is what I want you to do, and when we actually see the fruit of that action, when we see the why. And you see Noah living in this time, in this, in this land between. And in 2 Peter, he's called a preacher of righteousness. That, that he not only just does the, the ark, not only obeys God. In fact, there, there's a great statement in Genesis 7, 5. He said, Noah did all that the Lord commanded. But he also was a witness to the people and none of them listened, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't doing what God had called him to do. You see, that's, we can't guarantee the results, but we can follow God in obedience. And he says he did it in faith and he did it in faith for a long time. And sure enough, after he got the ark built, God did another miracle and he sent all the animals in two by two, a pair, male and female. And, uh, Here's a good joke you can tell your friends if they're not listening carefully. You can say, so how many animals of each kind did Moses take into the ark with him? And usually they will start telling you about a male and a female of the the unclean animals and seven of the clean animals. And then you can say, I don't think Moses took any animals into the ark. In fact, the ark of Moses was the ark of the covenant and it had two angels on it. But the point is, is that God did incredible miracles at the end of this story that the animals came in and then it says that God shut the door of the ark and there were seven days of waiting (laughs) in an ark full of animals and maybe God's given them time to figure out the feeding schedule before the, the cataclysmic destruction comes but there was a long time of waiting And yet God did exactly what God said he was going to do. There are many things that God allows us to see from creation around us. There are many things that in the creation, the Bible says that it's a witness to everybody all around the world, that there is a God, that he's powerful and creative. And there is also evidence that the flood really happened. And I I find this a fascinating subject, and let me just give you a few things about What are the evidences that the flood really happened? We find out in Genesis 2 that there was not rain on the earth at that time, that that dew came up from the ground or rivers came up from the ground. And we know that there was a a lush, rich uh, environment. We know that people lived a long time. And and so creationists have given a theory that perhaps the, the earth was covered by a thick vapor canopy. And that that's part of why people lived as long as they did. That's part of the reason for lush vegetation on the Arctic poles and dinosaurs living a long time because reptiles are the only species that keep getting bigger the longer they live. And all of these things point towards specific geological things. And for some people, this is hard to believe because the the science of today is committed to what's called uniformitarianism, that everything is happening the same, and if you have all these layers, they came about over millions of years, and the whole mindset is of an evolution without God. And creation is a witness, and I believe the universal flood is a witness. And if you have doubts about it, let me give you a resource that you can go to. It's on your paper outline. It will also be in the app. But this is a great movie. It's about a 45-minute movie. And he goes through all of the evidences that are not mentioned often in your science class of the ways in which a worldwide flood not only makes sense, but evidence all over, like mass animal graveyards in the middle of a continent, like in Utah, where we have incredible numbers of dinosaurs, seashells that are on the top of every mountain range in the world, including the Himalayas, and the fact that There are salt lakes that are way high in the mountains that would have had to have been a salt wave from the oceans that have become saline over from the flood and have become less saline over time. And and he goes on to mention the flash freezing of woolly mammoths in the Arctic and the incredible deep deposits of coal that had to come from plant and animal matter and all kinds of things that they walk through simply to say Not only is there evidence of flood all over our earth, but a creationist scientist can take the same evidence and say, wow, this points to exactly what the Bible says. In fact, 
There are stories and cultures of a great flood that wiped out the earth in early Chinese culture and in many parts around the world that remnants of the story last. So if you, if you struggle with that or if you find yourself interested in that, um, I would recommend that you watch that and you could believe that exactly what God says would happen, did happen, and in fact it has shaped our world in a major way. I, I wanted to also just highlight for a moment that it says... In holy fear, he built the ark. And some people react to that word about the fear of God. And so I think it's important just to take a sidelight and say, what is the fear of God? And, and there is uh, inadequate words, but let me just say a deep awe at the greatness and the power of God. And, and we way overuse the word awesome in our culture. And it's like, no, that's not awesome. That's just a silly kid video. What's awesome is the power of God. And I think in the past, Christian traditions may have overbalanced on the side of God being an angry and destructive and powerful God. And the, the fear side of it would have been more like terror. And I fear we have sw- we've swung to the opposite side where, where God is so loving and compassionate. People treat him like he's the big buddy upstairs and, and they don't take him seriously. And let me tell you, if... If you're handling electric wires, you want to know what the level of current is. And if you're hooking up a car battery and it sparks, people get scared. But that's 12 volts. It won't shock you. But if you're dealing with house wiring or if you're dealing with a cable that comes from a nuclear power plant, man, you better be careful. And God is powerful. And when we understand that he is a great God and that he's powerful, that we respond with respect And in fact, we respond with a fear of God that helps us keep our minds focused instead of the other fears. The proverb says that that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That there's a humility that says, (laughs) my brother had a poster on his wall that said, there's two basic facts of human enlightenment. Number one, there is a God. Number two, it's not you. And that idea that that there is a God who is holy and powerful. And I heard somebody say one time, well, if he's the kind of God that could send destruction on the earth or, or he could send people to hell, I, I, I don't want to believe in a God like that. And it's like, well, if there is a God like that, you better be really careful how you respond to a God like that. In other words, we don't get to give God a personality test and decide if we think he exists or not. That we need to find out who he is and respond with, with humility and with awe and with uh, respect And the other thing I think a fear of God does is it helps counterbalance what most of us struggle with, and that is the fear of man. We get way, way, way too concerned about what other people are thinking about us. Have you ever noticed that that when you do something stupid or when somebody else does something stupid, the first thing you do is look around. So if you grab your water bottle and you start trying to get a drink and it squirts the opposite direction... It's not so much that that made a big deal. It's that you want to know, did everybody see? And you know, I remember when I was walking in a strange building and I just was walking into the restrooms and all of a sudden I got about halfway across the room and realized this is the women's restroom. Uh, There's no urinals here. It was a good clue. It's all stalls. And uh, you know, nobody was inside there, thankfully. And I walk out and the first thing I'm doing is scoping out, did anybody watch me walk out of the women's restroom? Uh, It's going to be a hard story to explain. Um, our, our attention is so much on ourselves that we, we worry about what people think of us and we live often in the fear of what are people going to say, what are people going to think. And, and uh, Pastor Craig was telling me a story that I think really underscores this point that, that the fear of man gets wiped out when there's a greater fear involved. And he said he was, he was uh, going down the river with his two sons in an inflatable canoe And Craig is a masterful rower. I've been with him in the river many times, and he can handle all kinds of boats, drift boat, rowboat. And uh, this time they were in an inflatable canoe, and it behaves a little differently. And and they were just peacefully going down the river till they hit some fun currents, and all of a sudden the thing folds and capsizes, and Craig goes under the water, and he comes up. And you know, the first thing an experienced boatman could feel was, (laughs) did anybody see? Uh, This makes me look bad. But you know what was more important? As he came up and he couldn't see his two sons. And he goes under the water and gets sucked under again and he comes back up and he can't see them. And he does not care 
who's watching or who has seen him or how this makes him feel. What he cares about is that he's got to find his sons and he finally gets around the other side of the boat and they're clinging to this inflatable canoe and, and they're okay and his heart's relieved. And I think in much the same way that an adequate and understandable fear of an incredibly great God can help us get over ourselves can help us not live in the fear of circumstances or of what might happen or of, of what people might think because the one we really need to say, what do I care, who do I care about and what does he think? And we live for that audience of one. So I think that's a significant part of faith is when we see God for how great he is, it begins to wipe out the lesser fears that can control us. So Noah's faith made him obey. I think that fear of God is a cure for the fear of men. It helps counterbalance that. It helps change that. And in that obedience, we've talked about not only what does faith do, but what is faith? And, and it, the definition I've given you is a trust in God that leads to obedience, or a simple two word. It means trust and obey. It means that I believe what God has said, and because of that, I'm going to respond in action. This can lead to a, a bit of confusion because we begin to look at people and we see, do they have faith? And it's, it's easy to start doing a checklist about, well, do they go to church? Do they read their Bible? What's their language like? Uh, how much money do they give? Or, or whatever the external checklist might be. And the important point of Hebrews 11 is that it's faith that saved these people in the Old Testament. It's faith that saves us. It's trusting in Jesus. And that trusting in Jesus results in life change. But don't get the cart before the horse. It's not doing a whole bunch of good works so that you can be pleasing to God. It's trusting in Jesus. And then because we love him and because he loves us, we begin to change our actions. In fact, one of the ways I like to see people making steps in their spiritual growth, and one of the things that's worked for me is when God begins to change the way I see things. That the way of seeing changes about how I view my world, about how I even feel about what people think about me, about what I see as a win or success. That when the, the way of seeing changes, then my way of doing changes. And if people can get a great picture of God and if they in humility respond to him in faith, it changes how they behave. It's not the same thing as working for your salvation. In fact, in James, he kind of covers this question very, very clearly. He says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by actions, is dead. So he says, there is a fake faith. A fake faith is saying, I believe in Jesus. I believe you raised from the dead. Uh, I'm a Christian. I, I, I want to go to heaven when I die. To say all the right things, but to have it never be at the level that it actually changes your behavior, he says, that faith is dead. It, it's fake faith. But then he says, if someone says, you have faith, I have deeds, show me your faith without your deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. And so, this is a very important distinction, that it's not faith and works. It's not I trust Jesus and then I work hard to get into heaven. It's not I trust Jesus and I work hard to change myself. It is faith that works. It's the kind of faith that says I trust God and, and now because I'm close to him, I'm seeing my world differently and I'm seeing relationships differently. I'm seeing pain and difficulty differently. I'm seeing temptation differently. And because I see it differently, it changes how I behave. So people that have real faith, it has to come out in their life in action. But just people who are imitating actions doesn't mean that they necessarily have faith which is a great question for each of us individually to wrestle with. And it's also a great marker as we help people grow in spiritual maturity. So Noah is an example. He believed God. In fact, if you read the narrative carefully, God says there's going to be a flood. There was a, a humorous uh, comedy on, uh, on Noah and, Ar and his ark, and God says, Noah! And Noah says, what? And he says, I, there's going to be a flood and I want you to build an ark. And Noah goes, right. What's a flood? What's an ark? And then he says, who is this really? But can you imagine if there had never been really rain 
which is the significance of a rainbow appearing afterwards. If there was a vapor canopy and that's where the water came from that deluged and made a flood, if he had never seen a hard rainstorm, if he had never seen the flood, can you still build a boat big enough, bigger, almost the size of the Titanic? Why? His faith led him to believe God in spite of what everybody else would have thought, in spite of his own experience before that. And he believed God. And because of that, his faith saved him. It saved him. It saved his family. And in fact, (laughs) all of us came from Noah. He's one of our relatives. And his faith is to stand as a marker of people that believe God, that don't give in to despair, that don't go with the crowd, that don't give in to peer pressure but they trust God to be telling us the truth. And you know what? God says that judgment will come again and we don't know when it's coming and things get better and they get worse and we think, oh, this might be it. But I believe God wants to live with, wants us to live with that expectation that we don't have endless days, that this world is not gonna be forever that our response needs to be to him and if we can bring as many people as possible to know him and to, to live with him and to enjoy the peace that comes out of the faith, that no matter what the crisis, God is gonna take us through it and that we can trust him. I don't know how you've responded to the crisis we're in. I don't know how your faith is, but I wanna pray for us and then I wanna challenge you to have a little discussion in uh, whatever room you're in with whoever you're with or that you can, if you're by yourself, you can call somebody up and have a discussion with them. Let me pray for us. God, thank you that your word is true. And even when it goes against the current wisdom of our culture or the current flow of science or the current whatever, that God, you give us evidence that you keep your word and that you have the power to do what you say you're gonna do and that we need to trust you and believe in you no matter what we are experiencing. And Lord, there are those who feel like they're standing alone. Maybe they're the only believer in their family. Maybe they're the only believer in their classroom or the only believer at their job. And I ask that you'd give them the faith to extinguish the arrow of despair and of hopelessness. And that God, you would give us the faith to trust you and to to live in obedience to you, even if other people think that we are crazy. And that we would hold on to your word instead of everybody else's words. And that because of that, because of a holy fear towards you and because of a trust in your goodness and a trust in your truthfulness, that we would obey. Father, I don't know what that means in the life of everybody that's listening, but I ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would just tap him on the shoulder and say, this is what it means to trust and obey right now for you. In Jesus' name, amen.